Welcome everybody uh, to, our, to our June CCBA meeting. Um, if there are any uh, new people on tonight, you're more than welcome to say hello in the chat box and just introduce yourself in there and, and uh, welcome for sure. Um, tonight we're going to uh, have a, a brief officer report. We're going to look at our, our 2021 census results. Um, going to hear from Paul on cowboy beekeeping. Tim at some point is going to join us from his uh, uh, extracting room, I guess, and, and give us some uh, tips on, on extracting. Uh, Carla uh, from the horticulture committee is going to talk about what's blooming. And then their breakout sessions will have advance, which will be Keith if he's back from his hives. Uh, beginners is Tom, Russ, and Warren. I'm not sure if any of them are on tonight. I'll sit in the beginners group if, if they aren't there. Uh, if, if Ed or Steve were on, I want to talk mating yards and then website help. It's just a tough month uh, for beekeepers, as all of us know, because, you know, between, uh, you know, the, the hive management and the honey harvest, we have a lot of busy beekeepers this month. So we're, we may be a little uh, light on uh, experts. Uh, again, if anybody's new, welcome. Uh, to the CCBA. Uh, so far this year, we've had 127 new members, which is terrific. Uh, and we, we have uh, 600 primary and associate members. And uh, really, you know, my wife says, I don't get beekeeping at all. I don't see why people would want to keep bees and get stung. But she always says beekeepers are some of the nicest people out there, you know. Uh, so uh, she's a I think sums it up really well. And, and the goal of the CCBA is really to provide our members education and programs to promote sustainable beekeeping. And sustainable beekeeping to me means to care for your honeybees using best management practices that maximizes your bee health and maintains your enjoyment in beekeeping so that your colony losses and unanticipated expenses are minimal. So what sustainable beekeeping is not is sort of uh, putting bees in a box and, and thinking they're gonna take care of themselves and, and do well on their own, that's not. And I don't think there's, I was having a discussion with somebody this week about what's the right number of hives to have. And I think the answer to that is the right number of hives you can care for. Honestly, you know, so uh, beekeeping is a bunch of work, uh, and uh, a lot of us probably have more hives than than we can care for right now. But it's important that we care for them now that we have them. So, uh, and the goal for all beekeepers is only buy bees once. So, you know, to to really take good care of your bees and 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 develop uh, some skills that you're not spending uh, money on bee stock every year. And I think the CCBA is a good example of that. Uh, you know, for two winters in a row, we've had 100% survival. And I don't know what our hive count is right now, but like most of us, we, we, we've definitely increased our number of hives uh, this year. One of the things that I always put a picture uh, down on this slide of something that we're doing, that's Chris, my buddy Chris, if I need something if I need some crazy thing built, it's either Ed or Chris comes through usually, but Chris is down there in the, in our mating yard uh, and uh, sort of uh, helping us uh, with our local Queens and Queen cells. So, you know, we, we, we do uh, make Queen cells and, and made Queens and they're local and we sell them to club members in the hope to help people be sustainable. Um, I got good news for everybody. And, uh, put the slide up next. The CCBA July meeting will be an in-person meeting. Saturday, July 10th, so the second Saturday of the month, which is, I think, what we normally do, right, Jack? And Yes, George, sorry, I was muted. That's yeah, okay. Second Saturday of the month. In the and it's going to be 9 to noon. The location's going to be different, though. Um, the Cheslin location that we usually use is open, but they, their bathrooms are not open. So we thought it was probably not a wise idea and they have no bathroom facilities there. So we thought it was probably not a wise idea to, to hold a meeting there and not to have any bathrooms. So we ended up, I kind of, uh, with, with Jack and, and Lauren and uh, Paul's help, we, we, we're gonna hold it at the Concord Township Community Park 
which is on Smith Bridge Road in Glen Mills, Pennsylvania. Uh, on Saturday, and they have, a, they have a covered pavilion there. So that's where our July meeting will be. Uh, details to follow. There will probably be a restriction on the number of people. So we'll probably have a, a registration for the, for the in-person meeting. But surely we will do Zoom too. So we will continue to, uh, you know, offer everything virtually too as we go for it. But just to let you know that that that's uh, scheduled, and and thankfully, you know, our last in person meeting was was March twenty uh, twenty. So it's been a year and three months since we've met in person. Yes, Mark. So we have two new people that. So Marta. I'm new, just started doing the apprentice. And Monica from Malvern, do you not have, do not have yet a living hive, but are ready to roll. Awesome. awesome. That's so the 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 uh, the apprentice program uh, is surely one of our flagship programs. Thanks to Jack and and. Uh, and Walt, and uh, we, we definitely need to have, we need to expand that next year because it's definitely become popular and it's a great way to get started with beekeeping. So put that on your calendar. Uh, I will send out a, once I know all the the uh, details on, on whether or not you need to be vaccinated or not vaccinated and how many people and all that, that'll come out hopefully in the next week or so. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, the entertainment committee, uh, which is Tracy and Chris, are planning a September social event. So more information will be coming out on that too. So, you know, it's out, it's, it feels thankfully that the uh, pandemic uh, grip is, is starting to lighten a bit. So I look forward to, you know, getting everyone back together. So put that on the calendar. So thank you. Uh, really quick that this is our officers for 2021. Uh, myself, I'm George, I'm, I'm, I'm president. Uh, Paul, we have two vice presidents. VP one is Paul. Anything to say, Paul? No, not right now. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Paul will be back with us shortly uh, to do cowboy beekeeping, which I look forward to every month to listen to uh, how he's managing his hives. Mark Ametters is our is our second vice president, and he, he had something to show, Mark. And something yeah, I've got, to add. I've got two things to to show. Uh, well, I've got one thing to show, but I think we'll do that later in the show and tell section, unless we're not doing that tonight. No, I, I cut that out in the interest oh, you cut that out. Okay. Then, um, well, the first thing then is uh, we're doing one of the breakout sessions will be eHive for Broodminder. And we do have a special opportunity to buy, if you want to buy some Broodminder equipment for your hives, we'll, we, we're getting a 15% discount um, for a one time purchase. So it's up on the storefront. You can make your purchase. We will then order it on the 18th of June, and then we should have them have the, the materials in uh, here by the end of the month. And uh, again, it's a one-time event, at least at this point. Uh, anybody have problems with the ants getting into some of their equipment as you pull the stuff off? I, I, I just got so tired of it. So I built this little concentric basically two tubes. One's a, an inch tube and one's, I think, a two inch tube. Glued it with a with cement to the bottom, uh, to a piece of scrap plexiglass. And then I put oil on the outside tube. And it, if you use water, ants will walk right across the water. But if you use oil, cooking oil, uh, they, they will drown in the oil. So you can't you don't get all these ants going up into your hive. I mean, I, I just got tired of it. Where did uh, you put that? Uh, on the bottom of the hive or on the bottom of, of the equipment. I, the, my, I borrowed an extractor from a friend down the street and I came out the next day after extracting their ants were all over it, sprayed them all off and put the, the extractor up on three of these mm -hmm. and, and no ants. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Kathy Lopez is our second secretary. Uh, Kathy, anything to say? I have nothing to report. Nothing. Nope. Whole lot of nothing. Um, Kathy is Kathy and 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 uh, Vidya are our, our newsletter 
editors, right? Shared? Yep. So, you know, they do a fantastic job getting the newsletter out every every month. So uh, there there is an opportunity to run ads in the newsletter if members want to run ads and uh, look forward to continuing to see our committee leads and our officers write uh, articles for that. So thanks, Kathy and Vidya. That's a lot of work to do that every month. We're one of the few clubs that actually put out a newsletter every month to, to our to our membership. So thankfully, they're on it. Uh, Jack McMichael is our treasurer. Anything yep. to add tonight, Jack? Uh, full treasurer's report, as usual, was in the newsletter that just came out, so everybody can read the details there. Uh, George, you mentioned we've had 127 people join so far this year. Um, we actually have two others who have joined uh, but have not made their first dues payment yet. Um, so that would bring us to 129, which puts our total of 675 members. That's a big group. Uh, yeah, we, we definitely, I don't, you know, I don't know what we were pre-pandemic, uh, but definitely the, the size of the club is is growing and it's definitely gotten the attention of the board uh, for sure. And, uh, and uh, there's uh, ongoing discussions uh, a little bit about our operations and how we're operating. So uh, you will probably... Uh, You'll probably be hearing more about this in the next month or two or three, probably, whether or not we decide. Well, I, I usually try to disseminate information in multiple ways. I try to put it out at three o'clock in the morning via email, and then I try to put it out on the Facebook sites, and then I try to, you know, we'll discuss it at meetings. So uh, we, we clearly believe that the officers and the board clearly believe to try to be as transparent as possible about our decisions. I've been talking to Kathy about that, about having a, a, uh, a little section in the newsletter whenever the board has a vote on something. So you, so every, all the membership is kept aware of the decisions being made, but uh, you know, we are a 501 C three. So that, that uh, already uh, adds on sort of our responsibilities of what we have to do to maintain that designation. And now we're pushing a 700 member club. So Again, nothing, nothing changing now, but, but potentially some, hopefully some things that make all of our lives a little bit easier in the near future. So thanks, Jack. for the, Jack does a tremendous job. I don't know what the number of transitions are that have gone through this club. Jack probably knows. I'm sure it's in the thousands, right, Jack? Jack's muted. Just to give people an idea of- What do you mean by transitions? Uh, transactions, the number of transactions done by the CCBA this year? Uh, so far this year, we are at a little over 1,200. 1,200 transactions. Financial and, transactions, yeah. Yeah, so I, I can't keep track of two, you know, so thankfully, <laughs> thankfully, thankfully, Jack can keep, somehow keep track of 1,200 transactions. So thank you, Jack. Uh, Howard, anything to add as assistant treasurer? Nope. Uh, Tina, member relations, anything, Tina? Is Tina on tonight? Don't know if I've seen Tina. Well, Tina is our member relations. So if, if anybody has anything they'd like to uh, get 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 an advocate for or, or, or talk to somebody about or, or, or has, a, has something they think that the club could be doing better and doesn't want to chat with me about it, Tina is your person to go to. And Jen, is Jen on tonight? Everyone's busy. Jen, Jen is our, our, our IT website person. So she's great. Does a lot of things behind the scenes to, to make our website function so well. So that's, that's our officers. These are our committees. So a lot of the work does gets done through committees. Uh, there's a committee sign up on the website. Uh, I, I need to check that more often when people sign up. Uh, pretty much this is where most of the work gets done. So if, as a member, you're interested in getting involved in something, or if you, or you, you have a passion or you have an interest in something and you think the club could be doing it, then, then uh, you know, the best way to do it is through, through committee. Uh, George, um, to, your to your point about <clears throat> what the club looked like pre-pandemic, mm -hmm. I just did a quick filter on our active members and 466 of them joined prior to the pandemic. Now, there were active members last year over and above that number who did not renew for this year. So the, the total number of active members prior to the pandemic was larger than that. But 
as you said, we've had 129 new members this year. And uh, last year, it was larger than that. And most of those occurred after March. Yeah. So a lot of people have, have taken an interest in beekeeping and, you know, we're, we're, we're happy to be a resource to everybody. You know, I think that this is a, again, the, the, the mission of the club is education and to help people do it right. I should say, you know, like do it right. And if you're going to take care of bees, keep your bees healthy and uh, don't be buying bees every year. So, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm grateful for the people on this. I'm, tremendously grateful for the people on this list. I, I know uh, all of them personally, and, and it's really a great group of people. There's probably 30 some people on this list who really form the backbone of the CCBA. And uh, I, I, I count on them greatly to, uh, to, get the, to get the work done. And what happened in May, just as a, I, I posted this on my Facebook site, the thing on the left, this happened in May. It's not B related, but Anyone, you know what this is on the left? Anybody? This is beaver. So this is a beaver taken down a tree. So this is along my pond. I, I, I was, I, I saw this tree taken down and it was falling into the pond. I went down and I was like, oh, what did that? And I saw the beaver did that. So I thought that was a pretty cool picture. Of, so if you ever see a tree that looks like that with shavings next to it, that's beaver activity. So beyond, beyond the beaver activity in my yard. Um, it looks like you were making shavings for your smoker yeah you know i should collect them yeah you know hey, smoker fuel <laughs> he's taken down two trees so far so uh There'll i have more any... <laughs> i've heard that they don't usually stop once they start but no they won't <laughs> but he hasn't moved them he just took them down so i don't know I, I i haven't done my reading on on where the dam is being built but it, that was pretty cool um he, he could be Taking the smallest branches first. Oh, really? Yeah. Hmm. I, I promised Carla I would call her when I see the beaver around the uh, swimming in the pond because she she definitely wants to come over and 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 have a beaver party. Uh, but the beaver has not been swimming in the pond, Carla, yet. But you you're you'll be the first to know if I see the beaver come back. Maybe um, he's heard so about the price of lumber and he's considering selling it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, maybe I should train him, Marcy. That's a good idea. I never thought about that, but yes, that's a great idea. You know, <laughs> yeah. And, and just leave I, the plans for a standard long Langstroth box out there and let him go to work. <laughs> uh, so we had a hive crawl uh, through the pandemic. So thank you for the education committee and Steve and 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 the group that worked on and all the people that hosted sites. That was great. We did a plant swap uh, by Carla did a plant swap and, and that was great. Some people bought, brought some great plants and took home great plants. And it was, it was lots of fun. There was definitely some really knowledgeable people that showed up at the plant swap. So we'll be probably doing the plant swap again, you know, to, which is cool. Two queen catch Saturdays have happened. We've had a beginner's class. We had two alive at the hive live streamings. We had our 2020 apprentices pick up their local nukes from the CCBA period. We've had four B chats and we've had lots of apprentice teacher sessions. So it has been a, a busy May. Uh, so my message uh, to you this month, my message is usually short as president's message, extract honey. You know, um, if you're a new beekeeper and, and, and this is your first year beekeeping and you're worried that you're that your hive may not have enough honey, then maybe you want to wait until next year. But you know, if your hive if your hive is heavy, you probably can extract two frames. the The club has two extractors to rent. One is at my place, and the other is at Justin Schiffler's up north. Uh, so if you're interested in renting the, it rents for five dollars a day. Uh, if you're interested in renting the one of the club's extractors, you're to get in contact with me or Justin. Uh, and we'll try to figure out what days it's available. Uh, you are probably not queenless uh, right now. If, as Marcy said, if you go into your hive and, and you see no brood and, and you don't see a lot of bees, you probably will be queen right in a week or two. Uh, again, if you're not sure, throw a frame of eggs in there and cap brood in there. If you have that resource and go back and check in three or four days and see if they're making queen cells or not. Chances are they won't be making queen cells. Uh, make a split or two. Um, well, that depends, right? 
I, I go back to, can you care for a split or two? And do you have more bees than you need? If you have more bees than you need right now, you probably don't want to be making a split or two. But, you know, if you kind of have, if you kind of have three hives and you want to go into the spring with three hives, you have probably not a bad idea to, to make a split now. Uh, and, and go into the winter with four hives or five hives, uh, just as insurance. Uh, uh, the hives are big right now. If they haven't swarmed, uh, the, the nectar flow is slowing down. So what better thing to do with all those bees than to make a, make a new hive? Create uh, the nukes now. You can always recombine them later. Absolutely, Jack. Yeah. And, and June is the best, you know, it's sort of like, what's the best time to catch a swarm? May. And then June and July and August isn't that good. It's the same way with making new hives. If you're trying to make a new hive in May and June, it'll probably do well. July and August, when you start to try to make your splits, it gets much more difficult to make splits because of robbing, because of the decrease in nectar flow, because of they just don't have the time to, to create enough brood cycles to build up the population. Take it from me, I, I, I thought I was, I don't know what I was thinking, honestly. I, I made a bunch of splits I know what I was thinking, but I won't share. Uh, I made a bunch of splits in um, in late July last year, and and trying to increase my numbers. and And I would say fifty percent of my nukes didn't make it through the winter. Maybe even sixty percent of my nukes didn't make it through the winter. Not because I didn't treat, not because I didn't feed, just because they didn't make enough bees. You know, for some reason. Uh, uh, despite even feeding these nukes, I couldn't get them to make bees last year. So the population going into winters were only three or four frames of bees going into winter and they just froze out during the winter. So again, lesson learned from me, I'm, I'm making my splits this month to, 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 to make them. So, and then mite management. Uh, I, I know we talk a lot about mites. We haven't talked a lot about mites this year and I'm going to wait till next month to talk more about mites, but it definitely should be on your radar this month to, to what is your mite management going to be uh, and how are you going to do it? We probably will have a, a, a special uh, session on, on, on just on this topic because it's so important coming up in the next couple of weeks. I'm not sure how yet, uh, but we will, we, it, it'll definitely get more focus as the month goes on. Uh, I have, uh, done some mite levels at the apiary uh, alcohol washes on some of the hives at the CCBA apiary and they're all washed zero so far. So, uh, you know, um, why? I don't know. I think it's just early on, uh, but, you know, usually the, the mite levels start to start to climb and, and June and for, for sure July, we'll, we'll start to see some hives that are, that are higher in their, in their varroa counts. So, just put it on the radar screen. If you if you need to buy your miticides, it's not a bad time to buy your miticides now. Think about what you're going to use. And, and again, we'll have a, a special educational seminar just on mite management at some point. Probably two seminars because it's probably so important. But anyway, uh, I've become in, I've I've kind of uh, I'm all in on these double screen boards this year. I I, I have them on a lot of my hives. Uh, uh, the, my strategy is making vertical splits, uh, kind of taking, <coughs> excuse me, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, taking um, some brood, uh, some food and some bees and putting them above the double screen board and adding queen cells uh, and, 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 and making vertical splits this way. Uh, uh, why do I like this? Uh, just because I don't have to take it somewhere. Uh, and if it doesn't work, I just recombine the hive. If, if I, uh, decide to myself, uh, uh, I, I want another hive. I just basically just take that hive off that box. Uh, when I'm not using the double screen board, uh, to make a vertical split, it's sitting at the top of my hive for increased ventilation through the top of the hive. Uh, I've been transporting some nukes and instead of using it, uh, instead of using a inner cover and an outer cover or a migratory top, I've just been using double screen boards on the top of the nukes to transport nukes. And I just feel like uh, um, it, it, it's just probably a, a better way to transport nukes because it's more ventilation and you're less at risk of the bees overheating with a double screen board on the top. So uh, I'm not sure if the big bee companies make them. I'm sure they do. Uh, uh, I don't know. I just found, I just started using them this year and I really like them a lot. So I don't know if there's any other double screen board 
uh, users out there. But uh, anyway, something to consider on how to make your vertical splits. Uh, queen program, just a plug for the queen program. Uh, we've had uh, our, our next uh, queen catch, uh, our next queen, uh, made a queen and queen cell sale will be June 19th, next Saturday at 11 o'clock. There's queen cells and queens on the storefront. They sell out really quick. I apologize for that. We're, we're, we have a plan to increase our production. I just don't know. Again, the later in the season, the harder it is to make this stuff anyway. So the top picture is Daryl and I. We were, we were, uh, we were uh, playing around today with our with our artificial insemination, and and that's a that's a screenshot of of Daryl uh, pulling off some semen off a drone. Pretty pretty cool stuff that he's doing. So anyway, uh, there's we have our apiary and mating yard. We've talked about in the, this in the past. It's at 651 Brandywine Drive, across from the Embryville Athletic Fields. Uh, anybody's welcome to come up, come, come over to the apiary, take a look around what's going on. Uh, if you plan on going into the hives, uh, for any reason, you're going to have to let Tony or myself, uh, honestly, Tony know, or myself know what you're, why you're going into them. We don't really have a problem with them. If you just want to see them, or if you want to do something with them, but just let us know, don't go into the hives without letting us know, do not touch any of the hives. It, so there's the hives in the fet. Those are the hives in the fenced area at the apiary. About 300 feet behind the fenced area down the road is where our mating yard is and where people drop off nukes. Do not go into any of the hives back there unless they're yours. Okay, so just don't don't open them up and and don't be curious. Just let them be. Uh, we've gone over this before. There are pallets in the back. Uh, there's a little bit more vegetation growing around them now, but we're trying to keep them weed whack. There's 30. There's 30 spots for mating boxes along that back row. When you go, you'll see this green box there uh, and you basically fill out a form, let us know what position you put your box in and uh, put the form in there. The boxes can stay no longer than six weeks uh, just because the hives get too big then. Uh, I'd highly encourage you if you're making splits and you want them to raise your own queens, you can just leave the boxes there. We've had lots of people come to the, the queen sales. They bring their nuke. We put the queen cell in right there and they just leave the nuke there to mate and, and, and it's worked well. So again, just another effort to sustainability. And uh, at the end of the day, you, you have a new nuke, hopefully. Uh, just a small plug for our queen program. Uh, we sent uh, we sent five, five of our locally made CCBA queens to NC State, Dr. Tarpey's lab for, uh, for an assessment on quality. So they looked at uh, queen uh, morphometrics and insemination quality, and they gave them grades based on uh, sort of a benchmarking to other uh, queens that they've assessed. Uh, we got an A for, for queen morphometrics. And we got an A minus for insemination quality. One of the queens that we sent wasn't wasn't made it. <laughs> I don't know how I did that, honestly, because I'm sure I only pulled queens that had laying patterns, but maybe I didn't. Uh, so that brought us down a little bit. But our overall score, which was a, an A minus from NC State. So, you know, it's 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 just a little bit of affirmation that the that the queen team has been uh, uh, working together for a few years now. And I uh, and we do the CCBA does produce uh, quality queens. So Anyway, uh, Ray was not able to join us tonight, so I told him I would briefly go over the census uh, reports because I promised it last month and I didn't deliver and we promised it this month. And I do like to get, when asking people to fill stuff out, get back to you. So if you remember, uh, the, the CCBA census is an annual survey that comes out in March and April. Uh, the, uh, the goal of this survey is to sort of get a get a metric on the on who the CCBA is and what behaviors the CCBA is and how sustainable our beekeepers are. Uh, this year we had 254 people fill out the 253 people or something like that fill out the fill out primary members. It doesn't go to it doesn't go to associate members. It just goes to primary members. Uh, at March 1st, that represented 54% of the 
CCBA primary primary members filled out the survey. So uh, thank you all to, I'm sure many of you on tonight are, are the ones who uh, participated. Uh, and, and I'm really thankful because it, you know, when we get over 50%, I'm pretty clear it's given us a pretty good snapshot of what the club is. I did email this report out in full to all the members this morning. So everybody has a copy of this if you'd like to look at it in more detail, but the highlights of it. So when we look at the years of beekeeping experience in the CCBA, it's a nice uh, balance of percent uh, of experience. Majority uh, of beekeepers are less than five years, but if you look, the biggest group of beekeepers in the CCBA are those three to five year beekeepers, which represent 40% of the population, which is huge. Why? Because nationally 75% of beekeepers are out of beekeeping in three years. So you know, our, our, I think our club helps people be sustainable and get through the first year or two uh, and, and and they stay on. So I, I think that's great. And, and if you look, uh, it's a nice distribution. When you look at uh, apiary size of, of the majority of the beekeepers, the majority of the beekeepers are backyard hobbies, beekeepers for sure. So 12.9% uh, of the uh, of the uh, the people responding to the survey did not have any colonies yet. We're probably newer members. Uh, and 57% of the people had one to five colonies and 13% had six to 10. So when you look at uh, about, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm struggling with my math, 82%, uh, 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 a little about 80 to 85% of the, of the beekeepers in, in the CCBA have less than 10 colonies. So you guys are the majority and that's who we, that's who we're trying to serve. Uh, yes, a lot of the leaders are crazy and, and, and have way too many, no, I'm just kidding, uh, have, have, you know, have, uh, <laughs> you know, 10, 20, 50, 100, 200 colonies, uh, you know, there, there, there's, uh, there's probably something wrong with us. But again, when we think about, uh, when the officers and the board of director thinks about who we are serving, we know we're serving backyard beekeepers and we're trying to put programs out there that help backyard beekeepers because that's the majority of the uh, club membership. When you look at uh, how people are increasing the uh, number of colonies that they have, again, uh, what we'd like people to do is split their colonies. We'd like people to catch their swarms and we'd like people to purchase less bees, right? That's that's what we're trying to do. Uh, the blue is 2019 and the red is 2020. So these were the same questions asked and you're looking at the percent of people that, that said they did these things. So when you look at the number of people split colonies it's increasing, which is a good thing. When you look at the purchase of bees, it's a decrease, it's a good thing. Catching swarms, it's a good thing. Raising queens, that's an area that I think that, that we know that we have uh, fallen short on a little bit, I think largely because of the pandemic and, and maybe because I'm just too busy. Uh, we, we, or maybe because we, we have a queen program that raises cells and queens for people, but surely, you know, uh, there's lots of ways to raise a few queens for yourself and we'd like to see uh, the number of, of our members who raise a few queens go up. But overall, positive changes between 2019 and 2020 on how people are, are getting bees. Now, when people are buying bees, what are they buying, right? So the CCBA strongly believes, and I strongly believe, and Shirley Keith really strongly believes that we should not be, uh, we should be trying to limit the number of packages that we're uh, buying from the South. Why is that? Uh, uh, for a couple reasons. One is uh, we don't know... Uh, what diseases are coming up from there? If there are diseases coming up in the bees, are, are there mites different that are coming up with the bees? Uh, are the mites bringing different diseases coming up with the bees? Um, they're being made, uh, uh, are they going to sustain, are they going to survive as well? If, if, if someone new or somebody relatively uh, with little experience gets a package, is that package not going to make it uh, through one season, or is it not going to overwinter, and therefore they're going to be stuck without bees? Uh, so our, our, we definitely have been sort of trying to get people to uh, make nukes, make splits, uh, and sell their nukes. And how are we do, and I think we're doing pretty well. When you look at local colonies or nukes that people brought bought in 2019 versus 2020, you could see almost a twofold increase 
and a one and a half fold increase in the amount of no local nukes, which is great. Uh, and you see a slight decrease in the amount of packages. Yes, there are still a lot of packages. Uh, we do realize that that uh, that uh, there there are packages that that come up early. There's packages that are less expensive than nukes. Uh, people get to start their beekeeping earlier. There are there are definitely uh, probably some valid reasons why why it's hard to budge the, the number of package sales. But uh, one of the, the, the things that I would like to see, and, and, and surely there's other uh, 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 leadership in the CCBA would like to see that package number continue to go down. That's why I'm stressing, you know, about making splits this month. Uh, again, there's non-local colonies or nukes that are being bought, but there it's basically a sort of a, a, a competition between uh, local nukes and, and packages. And, and you can see that uh, packages exceeded local nukes last year, and this year local nukes exceeded packages. So again, I, I think uh, progress on that front. Uh, well, when you look at... Uh, uh, the queens, as the, the queen program is definitely having an impact. We're seeing a lot more uh, queens and uh, queen cells purchased from 2020 to 2019. Again, some of that is because our, our membership's up a little bit too. Uh, but why, uh, hopefully these are being used to, to make splits and, and not to, not to, uh, 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 not, not to cover for failing queens or or uh, hives that aren't managed well and that people think that queens or queen cells are gonna fix their management problem. We'd like to think that the majority of the queens and queen cells are being put into planned splits and increases and not into uh, emergency sort of uh, situations, but uh, it's probably a mix. But again, positive direction in that. Uh, when we look at loss, uh, the, the overall membership of the CCBA should be very proud of this. I, I, I don't like to, boast and gloat, but when you look at the, the two as biggest bars for two years in a row on percent of colonies loss is none and less than 25%, you know, and, 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 you know, the average for Pennsylvania sits in, 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 in this 26 to 50% category and probably uh, across the country. So you could definitely see that the CCBA beekeepers definitely have a left sort of distribution to left shift to the curve of what percent colonies they're losing. Now, uh, why is that? Uh, I, I think because uh, of all the things that uh, we talked about, trying to decrease packages, trying to increase uh, local nukes, trying to increase local queens, and also uh, to try to have a mite management plan, you know, uh, and we'll talk about that in a second. But this is this is really cool. When this is really cool. When you look at at 2020, over 30 percent of the beekeepers lost no colonies. Now they all swarm this year, right? You know, but but they 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 at least lost no colonies. So really impressive stuff. Really impressive stuff. Uh, when you look at uh, uh, did you have pests? We we all have pests in our hives. Uh, surely the recognition of small high beetles Hi, you? last year, uh, whether or not that's because there's more small, small high beetles or better recognition. Oh, that's no worries. A, it's, a, it's a Zoom meeting. Bit, a little bit of both. Uh, when you look at how people are, are, are monitoring for Varroa or people monitoring for Varroa, uh, what's no, really cool I'm is that uh, if you look at the alcohol wash percent, the people doing alcohol washes was 2019 was 31 percent and it jumped to 41% last year. So we had a 10% increase in the number of people doing alcohol washes. I think that was largely uh, because of our efforts in, in, in the Mitothon last year and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, and it, the powdered sugar, sugar shake, it should say sugar shake on here, and that stayed about the same, so 34%. So when you look at, um, and then some people do drone brood surveys, some people do sticky boards, uh, when you look at uh, uh, the percent of people that don't monitor mites at all, it only sits at about 18%. So most people are monitoring mites, which is great. Uh, surely we'd love to see the, uh, the percent of alcohol wash or sugar shakes go, go up because that's really what's recommended for, for, for mite monitoring. Uh, when you look at what people are using uh, to, to treat their mites, uh, 2019 to 2020, you see an increased use of oxalic acid 
Uh, you see an increased use of Formic Pro. You see an increased use of MitoAway quick, quick Strips. You see an increased use of, of Apigar, and you see a decreased use of Apivar. So again, if I had to write down what I would like to see happen in the CCBA, this is what we'd like to see. You would like to see fewer people using Apivar, honestly. You know, uh, Apivar is highly effective, one of the most effective miticides, uh, but uh, it probably should have, a, 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 you should be rotating your treatments around and you probably shouldn't be using Apivar all the time to treat your to mites. So again, I think it has a role, but to see a decreased use of Apivar, I'm quite pleased with, honestly. Again, I respect if there's differences in opinions, but this is how I'm looking at the data. Um, when you look at uh, how many people overwintered uh, nukes, I think this is still an area we did not budge very much last year. Uh, you see a you see a a a, a little bit higher uh, number of people overwintering one to three nukes, but since we're the majority of backyard beekeepers, uh, I'd like to see uh, this uh, I'd like to see this number much higher. You know, I I, I really do. I I think I think we need to. I don't know what we need to do to make this number higher. We sell our nuke kits. We we talk about splits. We. Uh, Again, uh, I just like to see this go higher. Maybe this is okay because everyone keeps their bees alive in the CCBA and they don't need to overwinter nukes because all their colonies survive. And that may be part of what's going on here. But I think to have a, I think to, to have a, I'm a big believer in uh, like, if you want to be sustainable, having a, a, a bunch of a, a one or two nukes sitting around is never, is, is, is a good idea. But again, we could discuss this more sometime else so that's the that's the i've always run over that's the the brief review or not brief review of the of the, of the census and you know to to wind to to summarize uh you know just to, just to thank all the 254 members that filled it up out i think it shows that the that the the initiatives that the ccba is doing to help backyard beekeepers are helping backyard beekeepers is there where to set the bar is is a tough one uh you know, I, I know, <laughs> I, I personally believe that human behavior is tough to change. And I think even if we get a few percentages better in the areas that we'd like to see uh, better, it, it, it's, it's, it's a good story. So uh, again, uh, we, I, my hope is that the census will continue to be done annually and that, you know, we'll get the majority of our members to participate in it because it, it does, uh, I think, uh, paint the picture of, of the sustainability of the CCPA. So with that, um, any questions about the census or comments? No, I can't believe I did that good of a job. Well, one of the breakout rooms uh, when we get there will be the main room, which will be myself to listen to any comments or anything anybody wants to chat with me about. So if, if you'd like to, chat just stay in the main room in the breakout room and again i welcome any emails or any you can always stop by my barn if someone uh uh it, it has a strong feeling on any of the data that was presented or any direction that the ccba should be going in so that's all i got for the census so i'm going to turn it over to paul for this cowboy beekeeping paul George, while we're waiting, this is Bernadette. And um, I'm wondering if there could be a uh, set of guidelines, best practices for overwintering nukes, because uh, I feel like I'm gathering a piece from here and a piece from there and, you know, listening and picking up bits and pieces, but maybe especially for uh, people who haven't done it before, uh, you know, a nice set of guidelines we can turn to, uh, especially for well in mind. That's great, Bernadette. I have to take a look in the uh, in the document section on the website. I don't think something like that currently exists, and if it doesn't, I'll I'll talk to Ed about creating something like that because it there are there are it, it's a good point. You know how you how you create a new because it is a little bit different in May and June than it is in July and August, and and mm -hmm. surely some of us you know. Uh, well, you know, not only create, but, the, the but, over, of it. 
I'm sorry, not only creating, but overwintering. Like I know I've picked up pieces about, well, you want to place it here next to the hive or you want to, you know, just about the placement and about how we treat them going into the fall and how we best protect them so that we can ensure a successful overwintered nuke. That's great, Bernadette. I, I, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, we'll continue with cowboy beekeeping. Uh, I was up to my eyeballs in honey in uh, May. Uh, it all started on uh, May 12th. Now, uh, up here in Downingtown, the geographical center of Chester County, it really started to warm up in May, and they really took off with uh, the hives, took off with the good weather. Um, the hot weather pushed the Ellie Agnes and the bush honeysuckle uh, into full bloom around the 1st of May, between May 1st and May 4th up here. But it took uh, 1,458 accumulated growing degree days to get the black locust to open up here. And black locust opened here about May 16th. And uh, then we had the real hot weather. It only lasted about 10 or 12 days. And then the, the hot weather just uh, dried the blooms right up. But uh, it was pretty good while it lasted. So in order to get ready for the black locust, uh, I started taking honey on May 12th. That was my first harvest. And uh, I got about 144 pounds uh, from uh, May 12th and May 19th. Uh, but the May 19th was quite different because it had the black locust in it. And you could see the color difference. Uh, it was golden for May 12th and it was pale green and pale yellow for uh, May 19th. Uh, the black locust continued to uh, another extraction on May 25th. Uh, that was pretty much classic uh, black locust. So May 25th was a good time for uh, black locust. And uh, I continued to extract uh, June 2nd and June 9th. And so right now my four hives have produced 420 pounds for me. And I'll call that a good year. And uh, I don't take the... Uh, I don't wait for the bees to uh, cover them with wax. I just take them when the frames are heavy. I go through each individual super uh, frame by frame. And if it's heavy frame, whoop, it, I take it right out. A few swipes of a duster and the bees are gone. And uh, I cover up that super and keep adding to it. So uh, a little bit more on that later. Um, the second thing that happened uh, with uh, my hives was uh, swarms had a lot of swarms, more than usual. I didn't do a demery, so I paid for it. But the first swarm that I had was of a nuke. And it was a, a single five frame nuke. And I really didn't pay attention to it. I was trying to sell it, but uh, didn't get around to that. <clears throat> so on, uh, I think it was April uh, 28th was the first swarm. But uh, it landed in a uh, nearby lilac bush. So I was able to uh, knock it into another nuke box. And I saved that swarm. And uh, I gave it another uh, five frame nuke deep uh, on top so that uh, she wouldn't swarm again. And then I went back to the one that did swarm and gave it a second five frame nuke box. And I had originally two, two nuke boxes. So uh, I gave them all two uh, five frame deeps. So I thought that would uh, take care of it, but uh, and I had seen a, uh, a virgin queen into the original uh, <clears throat> white nuke that had swarmed. But uh, let's see, uh, it, was a, a, the, it had a, a queen in there on May 10th, but that same nuke swarmed again on May 21st, even with the double deep nuke configuration. But uh, that virgin queen was apparently not satisfied with the space, so she took off. Well, she landed in another lilac bush. And I saw it and uh, knocked it into another box. This time I went into a 10 frame deep. So I figured maybe the extra space would uh, keep her uh, <clears throat> back on the farm. And uh, she has. So she went out and uh, made it and came back. And then the, uh, the uh, nuke, the original nuke that had cost me two swarms also had produced another virgin queen. She went out and got mated and she was uh, back in producing. So now I have four hives and four nukes. But uh, I didn't have a problem with single brood chamber. So I tried uh, Steve Rapaski's method for single brood chamber. So when I looked into the new hive, what I call the new hive on May 12th to look for honey, 
I found uh, nine full frames of brood and 14 queen cells. So that, of course, it swarmed, even though I gave it another uh, 10 frame deep. So uh, they didn't like the single brood chamber management, at least not my single brood chamber management. So production on, on uh, that hive uh, really fell off. But in order to beef up the, and then uh, the, uh, the hive next to it, the green hive, which had produced a lot of honey, uh, also swarmed. So here I am with two hives that had a lot of honey and they were influenced by swarming. So I turned to my nukes because I had four nukes as resource hives. And the cypress nuke is a triple decker five frame nuke. So I ended up taking uh, eight frames of brood out of that nuke alone and distributing it to the green hive and to the new hive to build them back up. And then I looked at the, and that's a good way to uh, manage your nukes. Uh, you keep taking brood out of them and giving them to uh, hives that have swarmed. You build up your uh, population of bees when you need it, when the queen is uh, out of production or when the virgin queen has not initiated egg laying, which can take about a month. So nukes as a resource hive uh, really saved uh, the honey flow. And then I went into the uh, white hive on, I think, June 2nd, and I found swarm cells in there, real <laughs> small ones and high up. So I don't know if she was injured. I don't believe that hive swarmed at all. So I went in there on June uh, 8th, and the queen cells had all gone except for one that was open. I never saw the virgin queen, and I said to myself, you know what, I'm not going to wait. I'm going to go into this white nuke that has a queen that is laying eggs. So I went into the white nuke, captured the queen, gave her a marking, nice little marking, put her into a queen box, stuffed in uh, five more helper bees, and then put that queen cage into my white hive. So now they will, and I haven't looked yet, but I'm, I'm sure that uh, she will make her way out of there in uh, two or three days. And I'll go in and look there and that hive should be uh, up and running and uh, wouldn't be. Why do I like the white hive so much? The white hive has produced 175 pounds of honey for me on its own this year. So I wanna keep it running in a good configuration. So that was my fun for uh, May. Uh, lots of honey and quite a few swarms. But it all seems to be under control. So what I'll do with my bees uh, this month, and <coughs> I'll continue to uh, examine them to uh, check for swarming behavior and uh, attempt to diffuse it. Um, I'm also regularly uh, removing the green drone frames from the hive that have sealed drone brood. I take it out and put it in the freezer for a day and then recycle it back into the hive. And so far for my four hives, I've uh, removed 11 frames of drone brood. So it's a good biological control to get rid of the mite because the mites prefer to lay and raise their eggs mm. in the drone cone. Drone, drone larva take 24 days to mature versus a worker's 21 days. So keep the uh, drone brood flowing. Uh, let's see. Mostly I'll be still evaluating the deeps and the supers and uh, see how heavy they are. And that's what I go on. I go by weight. Um, and I even take the deep frames. You should take the deep frames because uh, you can uh, be overwhelmed by uh, honey being piled up in the deeps and restricting the queen's ability to find an open cell. So uh, by all means, don't get honey bound. Look in those uh, deep boxes and remove the uh, frames that are full of nectar and honey. Pretty much uh, the ones on the edges, number one and number 10 frames, uh, they're usually capped and they're usually full of honey and, uh, and nectar. So most frames that I take for the honey harvest are uh, really only just partially sealed with wax. Sometimes they might be totally open, but by a heft test, if they're really heavy, I know that they're ready to take. So the bees cap with wax those cells when they, when they measure that it's 18.6% water, but they're under no obligation to do this. So you can have totally perfect honey that just doesn't have a cap on it. 
But in order to judge this, make sure you have a refractometer. If you have a refractometer, I mean, get a good one. There's a nice one that Man Lake sells for uh, $79.95. And uh, that's a real nice job. You can even take a toothpick out, stick it in your uh, cells of honey that you uh, are, are thinking about taking, put it on the refractometer. It might take about 10 cells to get enough for the refractometer. And then it'll read it. All of my honey has come out below 17% this year. <clears throat> All of it is just uncapped. So it was a nice hot summer and I ventilate the hives well. Uh, I stagger each hive about uh, uh, an inch back uh, from the, the brood chambers and then I stagger each super. And I have like uh, four supers on uh, one hive, uh, three on the other hives and they're all staggered and the bees come in at any level and uh, deposit their uh, hard earned, hard -earned uh, work. Um, you can give it the shake test. Take a frame and shake it sideways. If no nectar comes out, if it's all stuck in there, that means it's probably ready to take. So you don't have to wait until it's uh, fully capped. I mean, it's safer to wait until it's fully capped, but you're going to miss a lot of honey. So that's my secret. I take it often. I put those wet frames right on back on the hives and they just keep filling it up. Okay, so, yep, my... Uh, my water is uh, 16 to 17%. That's mm. what I'm getting this year. And it really helps if it's uh, really hot, those 90 degree days. Uh, when will you hot. start looking for your mite levels, Paul? Uh, in July, I will. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I'm too busy to check right now. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I've looked at a lot of drones that come out of the drone comb, and I haven't seen any that uh, have had the mites on them. So, it was uh, interesting. Like we had a whole lot of small hive beetles early in the season. I haven't seen a small hive beetle in a month. Oh yeah, I have some. Not as bad some? here, but I have some. Hmm. So I'll put a Swiffer sheet on. Uh, I put it on the the top deep, just underneath the uh, <coughs> queen excluder, and I have uh, hive beetle traps with uh, oil, and I bait them with uh, banana peel and vinegar. So I found some in the traps, and uh, but mostly I find them on the Swiffer sheets. Do you think on average you're in your hives more than once a week or about once a week, Paul? I go in once a week. Once a week. So every time you're in, you're pulling, you're pulling frames that are heavy. Yeah, I'm pulling heavy frames. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you lift the whole super off and it's really heavy, <laughs> you know right. that's going to you get eight or ten frames out of that. Hmm. I mean, with I have the time, I use a, uh, what is it, a, a Boardman or a Bee Escape. Mm -hmm. uh, that works. That works really well. But uh, I only have one, and it's really not a big effort to go through uh, each super uh, frame by frame. Do you think, I mean, your hives, you're, you're taking so much honey off, off your hives. Do you think, do you think, the bees just working harder because there's less, there's more open space, or do you think they work less because they're trying to get, to, you know, like what's your theory? But do you have any thoughts more behind them, that? More of them will work harder. I mean, most of the bees are just hanging out, resting. So they're not <laughs> all out foraging. So you give them something to do by providing some open frames and they'll go out and fill it. And they'll do it. <laughs> you don't have lazy bees, do you? I don't think so. <laughs> you don't let them be lazy, eh? Uh, no, you can induce <laughs> them. You can induce them into productivity. Well, that's what they say. Like you could, the bees can go from forager to nurse and nurse to forager, and you wonder, you wonder if taking that nectar honey off frequently is 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 somehow getting a bigger forager force out there, more active, you know, with because you have open space all the time. It's interesting. Uh, my longwood hives aren't doing as well. Uh, they have a lower population, and I'm trying to get them to. Uh, I have three supers on them, and the lowest super is mostly undrawn comb. I gave them that super last year, and they refused to draw it up, and they're refusing to draw it up here. They bypass it and go upstairs, and they put the honey in the other two supers. <laughs> I mean, do you, do you try, have you tried swapping them? Putting it up on the top? Yeah, I think they'd never get there. I mean, I, I could try it. I, I, have hive, I have a hive that produced. I, I have a hive. I have a hog half comb 
box on a hive that's produced 200 pounds of honey this year. And, and the hog half comb has probably weighed, the whole box probably weighs 10 pounds. I was like, I, I it cannot get them to, they, I cannot get them. To, they'll build out some of those cassettes and they'll put some honey in it, but I cannot get them to, and it has nothing to do with bee population. I, I don't know what it has to do with. I'm not good at, uh, at comb honey. Comb honey, yeah. Five, five frames in there, one of the hives has five frames and they build it all out with wax and then they sparingly throw <laughs> some honey in there as an afterthought. Yeah. But I put a regular frame with regular foundation right next to that, they'll fill that right up. <laughs> I don't know why. Yeah, it's interesting. Anyway, any, any, that's any, Cowboy Beekeeping. Thanks, Paul. Keep your super stacked high. And harvest frequently. <laughs> that's the secret. Of course, Keith probably has 4,000 pounds by now. I, I think that's the number he threw out there recently, 4,000 pounds. So I, I think he I think he actually said that somewhere recently. So Yeah, it, it's going to, it's 5,000. <laughs> <laughs> he, Keith's another, another f- harvest frequently, right? Kind he of. Taught me. He taught me. Yeah, a- absolutely. T- Keith's a great teacher. Absolutely. So uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, Carla, you want to talk about what's in bloom? Carla, Carla. Yes, I'm here. Hi. Um, Carla is our co-lead of our horticulture uh, committee. Uh, Jesse, who we all know well, is, is I think, working in the ER tonight. So Carla is uh, filling in to talk about what's out there in our yards. Uh, yes, thanks, George. Okay, so as far as trees, what we're going to see and what we're talking about um, this month are, are um, trees and shrubs and perennials that are going to be native to this area, the the region, which is the Appalachian Piedmont region, and are um, going to be bee friendly. So the first we're looking at right here is the catalpa tree, and that uh, is a picture from Jesse's yard. Um, so it, if you could do, go to the next slide, please. And then we have some shrubs. The elderberry was in the plant sale this year. Um, so Jesse's of course is, it is quite a bit older than the ones we got at the plant sale. There's also an Itia. That's the, um, that one's from my yard and it's, it's probably right there. It's probably about seven years old. That, um, that plant puts off runners and, and is it will hedge out, but it has these beautiful, long, like caterpillar shaped um, blooms on it. And um, then, then finally we have a, the St. John's wort, which will, will um, become kind of a, a bush, roughly three to four feet, um, maybe less than that, more like three, two and a half to three feet in diameter. Um, okay. Next slide, please. Here are some uh, herbaceous perennials. That's gonna be a non-woody perennial native to this area um, that are going to bloom in June. And uh, the purple coneflower, uh, goat spear, that's an astabelia. Um, I wanna say that was part of the sale. George, do you remember seeding those? No, I don't I remember. That up? Okay. I thought about seeding them for you, for y'all, but <laughs> um, it, we didn't get there, but maybe the next sale. And then, and then uh, the last one here is an iris versicolor, which is on my short list um, for getting is it, it likes to be in a uh, wetter, partially shady area. And I'm always looking for those types of plants. Uh, next. Next, um, you're gonna see on the far left, that's, that's a tick seed. So it's going to be um, a very, it's going to make a large area. You're gonna have lots of it. Uh, same with spider wart, um, which is the one in the middle. The spider wart was part of the sale this year. According to Paul, it's super aggressive. <laughs> um, and the final picture is a, a flea bane, which is, is kind of the, a low leaf weed flower as most people think about it. It pops out of your yard in, in onesies and twosies. Um, 
but but it can mass when allowed to go when it's allowed to do so together as you see in this picture here and it's quite pretty with a, a, a light pink um, shade to it as part of the aster family. So if you see it kind of coming up between the cracks on your sidewalk or, or um, randomly stuck in the middle of your lawn, you might want to think about plucking it out and moving it to a garden bed because uh, the bees certainly love it. Uh, is that the last slide or is there another one, George? No, that's the last one, Carla. Okay, so those are the those are what's in bloom right now for the for the month of June. Thanks, Carla. I always every, everything I don't know why that's flower, and I, I, I take a picture and and uh, send it to Carla and Jesse. Usually, it comes back non-native, so uh, <laughs> I have a lot of work to do still. But uh, I, we're we're very grateful to have uh, Carla and and Jesse leading up the plants. I used to do that, but they. That they they have taken it to a whole nother level and a whole nother set of knowledge. So uh, it is the most important thing that uh, that uh, we can do to help the uh, all the bees out there is to plant native flowers, plants, and trees. So uh, if if you have uh, questions, uh, I am not speaking for them, but I, I know they're they're always more. I know they're always. Uh, if they're available, willing to, to give some guidance and it's usually great guidance. So um, I think we're gonna uh, probably have a plant sale in the fall, but that's still to be determined. Uh, but uh, again, I think we sold a couple thousand dollars worth of plants. So it, it's it's great that that uh, that we're doing that for sure. So thanks, Carla. Uh, Tim, are you on? I, Tim, Tim, Tim Ferris. Yes, Tim Ferris is on. I asked Tim. Tim said he was going to be in with his extractor. So I asked Tim if he would be okay with sharing anything that he thought would be worth sharing from his extractor room. Do you see Tim, Mark? Yeah, I see him, but he's not muted. Or I'm sorry, he is muted. Is he paying attention? I'm not sure. He may have stepped <laughs> away for a moment. Why don't we step, step on to the next topic and then we can come back. Thank you for keeping me moving, Mark. <laughs> uh, uh, B-chat. Uh, we, we do B-chat every Friday night, 7 and 9 o'clock. Uh, you can find all the details for B-chat on the event calendar. Please join us. You know, uh, it's really, uh, it, it, you know, sometimes I feel like the meetings get a little uh, sort of process heavy and not and not and not uh, enough on what to do. But surely, B chat's really where we're talking about what's going on with your hives this week, what people are doing, any recommendations that people have. So if, if you just want to, if you want to sort of, you know, get more of that sort of flavor of stuff, that's the place to join every Friday night. Really wonderful experts giving advice on there. So George, we have two, one comment, actually two comments. So Walt says the club has a refractometer for the members. It did, but I can't find it. If anybody has the club refractometer, so yeah, we can get it, you're fading in and out, Mark. But yes, I, I probably, I probably loaned it out to somebody about two years ago. And I can't remember who I gave it to. And they may have brought it back. And I can't remember where I put it. I, but the bottom line is the, the, the club's digital refractometer is MIA. So if anybody uh, may perhaps have it, just let me know so we can put it back into service. If not, we may end up buying another one because I, I, I may have lost it. George, I just want to throw the offer out there that if anybody wants to bring their honey to either my residence at the north of the county or at my work in Exton, um, I can bring my refractometer and we can test your honey. Um, people have done that in the past, and I'm, I'm willing to, to do that and teach them how to use the optical refractometer. So don't be afraid to ask fellow beekeepers if they have one. You know, maybe someone that lives near you might have one. You can borrow it or they can show you how to do it. But I recommend everybody with the optical refractometers calibrate theirs each day you're using it. 
Um, it does fall out of calibration. Temperature can affect it. Use a cold pressed extra virgin olive oil and you set that middle brick scale to 71.5 and you're good to go. Thanks for the offer, Justin. And Robert Yokin had a comment on drone frames. Are you aware of the issues with pupil cannibalism and the spread of DWV? Deformed on comes on tonight, or, or Paul, you want to handle handle? I'm gonna I I'm gonna I'm gonna not handle that one because I don't know where Keith or one of our. And he did post an article in the chat from Nature magazine. I'm just reading the abstract right now. And uh, uh, it says they get uh, yeah, might 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 be might be uh, an issue, but that would only be an issue if you had high levels of deformed wing virus in your hive to start with. Thanks for sharing, and that's accessible to everybody on on the on the call on the meeting tonight, Mark. Right? Correct. Cool. Yeah, thanks for spotting it. Anyway. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, know it's great to share. So, you know, the, the CCBA forum on the Facebook site's a place to share and, and uh, BChat's a place to share. So thank you so much. Um, we, um, cannibals you know, if, do the same way. <laughs> if Tom or Russ joined at all for the beginners group. Okay. So I'll, I'll sort of head over to the beginners groups. So any beginners who want to, sort of hang out, I'll head there. Keith is doing advanced. Um, Ehive is Mark. Um, website help is Jack. Uh, I don't know if Ed and Steve are on for Queens and Nukes, so that, that may not be happening because I don't think I've heard from either one. And, and then try another shout out to Tim for his extracting tips? Yeah, I will. Yeah, Tim. Tim, Tim. I think Tim... Tim probably thinks I forgot about him. He's on. He should be not listening. Not listening. Hey, mate, I've had to go do a... He started his video for a second, but then he turned it off. I, I had to go do a uh, swarm check for a lady. She's got three three swarms in her house. It's the one that I got sent that was posted on the um, on the club Facebook page. So I, I had to go and check that because she's the, um, we're going out of town for a week. Um, I was going to do the honey demonstration on extraction on the Monday um, live at the hive instead. So if people want to watch that, they can log into a live at the hive and I'll show them how to do it then. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tim. Okay. Sorry about Sorry bugging you while you're driving. That's all right. Trying to get to the yard before it gets dark and put queen cells in. And then I gotta go finish another swarm cutout tonight. <laughs> Fun. At least it's cooled down. Tim, you're not looking like you're having fun. There, you know, smile. Come on, you can do it. <laughs> oh, I've done a swarm cutout almost every night for the last month. Wow. From the five days I went away for vacation. It's uh, the swarm management over the past year has been pretty, pretty average. This past season yeah i don't know if it's if the swarm impulse is greater or or yeah, i think so we've had cool hot cold weather hot cold weather rain it hasn't been an ideal normal flow build-up season build-up for this year has been different so if your hives haven't drawn out wax then they haven't got usable space and you've got more swarming going on yeah i think um, it's definitely higher this year i've gotten more swarm calls this year including two today yeah. Than the last three years combined. <laughs> yeah, like I, I picked up four swarms out of trees last week. Um, it slowed down on the on on swarming. Some of the swarms that we're looking at cut out. Some of them been have been there for a year, and um, and and then some are you know they've been there for three weeks. So it just just a flow on effect. And it, I'm finding it's in wealthy areas. Whether it's an increase in beekeeping in those areas with new beekeepers um, with and not knowing how to control swarms, or it's just the fact that the wealthy areas groom their trees so much that if you've got a, a tree with a natural cavity where the bees would tend to go to to start with, um, those trees are just not there because they've been taken down for insurance purposes. So 
Or it's just those areas, the ones that, that call you because they've got the money to spend and other people just leave the bees there. <laughs> One of the two. <laughs> well, thanks for... I'm, I'll to... join the uh, beginner's breakout room too and listen on that um, if I can. I've just, I think I've got about five minutes before I'm in my next yard and driving. Sound good. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. We're recording. Well, welcome, yep. everybody. So... Uh... This first 30 minutes for anybody new is sort of just informal of uh, just uh, answering questions or if people have things they want to talk about, uh, whatever's on people's minds, you know, hopefully be related. <laughs> uh, George, this is, this is Tim. I have two questions. I just wanted to have a little conversation of how everyone is finding their honey harvest this year. And secondly, I was trying to keep my swarming down. <clears throat> I had some humongous hives. And so I threw another deep on the top. And now uh, I was in there checking it today and they filled up the entire deep with honey. Hmm. So, you know, I'm just looking for a little advice on, would you extract all that? They, they, they didn't do much in the supers, but they, they filled up the deep, which is like incredible hard to get off. Yeah, I think uh, May was... You know, we had we had 21 straight days of, of great foraging conditions in May. So a lot of the hives did put on a lot of weight in May. So I think uh, most people, at least locally, are going to tell you that this year was a, an above average honey year as of now. You know, I mean, there's still, you know, June, July and August and September. And, and that will surely depend on how much continued rain we get. But May was incredible. Um uh, well, one of, the, one of the things that you can do is you can start moving. If there are honey frames down below, first you can pull them, uh, either put them in the freezer for extraction later or extract them and then put them back in. Um, you can also do the kind of a modified demerit and move some of the frames from your brood chamber that have brood in them, brood and, brood and eggs, move them up. And that will tend to draw the bees higher into your into your hive. Yeah, you know, and and his and most people would say, you know, don't take a frame of honey to extract until it's seventy five percent cap. Now, I know there's been some commenting on the forum site that you know if if you shake the frame and no nectar comes out, that it's okay to take. Uh, you know, if it's less than seventy five percent cap, I would suggest getting a refractometer, taking a little of the nectar out of the cells and, and do a quick uh, moisture content on it and make sure it's less than 18% before you harvest it. Uh, you know, the problem with too high of moisture uh, is fermentation over time. So it's okay to eat immediately, but if you're going to, you know, if you're going to extract it and, and leave it in a, and leave it in a five gallon bucket, it's, it's, and, and it, the moisture content's higher than 18%, it's going to ferment on you. So, yep. Uh, well, believe it or not, these are all capped. Everything is capped. Well, excellent. You know, I mean, you have a decision. You can either, you know, take it for yourself or leave it for the bees. You could also make some splits. I mean, there's, you know, big highs. We're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. I mean, uh, you know, May, June is the best months to make uh, your splits, to make overwinter, to, you know, to make nukes to overwinter. Uh you know, so if you have a big population of bees, it's you could split them up and make some splits too. Sure. Yep. Well, actually, I caught. Uh, I have nine hives, which is way more than I need right now, <laughs> and because uh, I had caught three swarms, and mm. so I'm like over the max. But I might make some splits and sell some. Yeah, I mean, I think that's an option. You know, um, yeah, if you're a successful. If you're if you're if you're a successful beekeeper, it's really hard to stay at the three hive level, right? I mean, we all know like it it, it can it can add up quickly. So, you know, the club always accepts bees. You know, I mean, we we have a bunch of initiatives that I always will accept some extra bees. Uh, so, if anybody has extra colonies that they want to that they want to donate to the club, I'm more than happy to take them. We you know, we have, we, we have up, we're going to have up to 60 mating boxes going and, and we're going to be having, you know, we have 40 some people in the apprentice program this year. So, you know, I, I'm always looking around for bee stock for sure. But no, it's great. I mean, if you have, if, if you have, you know, 
you're going to, you know, the, the other thing about having a lot of those highs, you're going to have to make it, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about planning your might management, you know, and surely might management uh, is not, it's not easy or is it not, it's not cheap. So, you know, you, you just, you, you do want to make sure that you are capable of taking care of all the highs that you have. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of like, you know, so it, it's kind of the, the hard, the hot days of summer are coming up, you know? So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like it's good though. <clears throat> and did you have another question, Tim, or no, or was that, did we? No, that was the two. Yep. Thanks. Yeah. Yep. I have a question. It's John Anderson. Hey, John. Hey. Congratulations on your transition to uh, mediums. mediums, right? It's a wonderful thing. <laughs> <laughs> I've, been, I've been watching it on, 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 online there a little bit. So, yeah. so um, we continue to battle uh, the wax moth. Now, I've, I've used the paradichlorobenzene. And uh, that does a great job, but it's really difficult to get that smell out of the uh, out of the frames. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering what other people are doing to store their frames to prevent the wax moth and occasionally get wax moth in the hive itself. So I, I need a better strategy than what I've had in the past. Yeah, I'm going to defer to somebody else. I mean, I'll just tell you, I've never really dealt with wax moth, but I leave my, I leave my frames uh, outside underneath my barn on a rack. So I, I think they get air circulation and light. They do get robbed out, but, you know, I've never had a problem with wax moth. Story the light is the key. Outside. The wax moths don't like the light. Thanks. Really? They, they, well, they won't go in the frames that are in the light. They want, they want the dark, just like inside the hive. That's great because, you know, I would cycle them through the freezer, just make sure you kill everything. Right. And I'd still get wax moth, but I was uh, storing them in those black uh, storage with the yellow, uh, yeah. yellow yeah. Light you see everywhere. Yeah. So that may be the key then. You're saying they, the light, they don't like light. They don't like the light. Ah. Not, not where they're going to lay their eggs, no. Okay. They, they, want, they want to be in a dark place so is there any concern with with the the ants that are going to be all over them so we we deal with that too but that hasn't been a huge concern okay um George, you, you, you can also you have ant problems on your no i don't have ants i don't have mice i just i just you know they're they're on a they're on a rack underneath my underneath my barn you know outside uh huh uh ed sharp is that on now only Ed can do this because not everyone else can, you know, turn a, turn a, uh, what did he do, Jack? He turned a, he took a bakery rack, a bakery tray rack yeah. um, that, that you find in any bakeries. They have the, these rig, big racks that store up to, I think, 40 bakery trays. And he widened it, cut it in half, widened it by two inches. <laughs> and it wow. makes a perfect frame hanging rack on wheels. Yeah, so he has a hundred frames on his baker's yeah, rack. It's really cool. Do like hundred and twenty-five on it. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I need to. I need to think that one through because I'm tired of fighting. <laughs> like I said, the paradichlorobenzene works, but boy, it's a pain. Yeah. I, I, actually, before I knew Ed had done that, I had done some research and contacted one of the major manufacturers of those bakery tray racks to see uh -huh. if they would be willing to do custom stuff if I got them enough volume from beekeepers and, and they said they had no interest in it. <laughs> well, you know what? Unfortunately. <laughs> I'd like to have some of the racks that Ike has. <laughs> yeah. <some> racks. <laughs> At 20 bucks a piece? Oh, never mind. <laughs> That's what he charges for. Wow. <laughs> so the, the, uh -huh. um, the, the other thing you can use is Sertan. It's a bacterial spores. So you can spray those in your frames and it will kill the larva. Huh. Can you spell that for us, Daryl? Uh, yeah, sure. Bacillus thuringiensis. You can spell that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Got it. It's a, it's it's a, yeah, Sertan, C E R T A N. But it, it's it's a specific like a uh, strain of Bacillus thuringiensis, and like like you know the, the state uses that to control other kind of insects and stuff. Um, but there's specific ones for beekeepers for the wax wax moth. Not harmful to the bees. Exactly. <clears throat> yeah, it's 
doesn't really have many off-target uh, effects. Yes. Um, yep, it's just a spore, so you mix it up and then spray it in your frames, let them dry, and then they're good to go. It'll kill any butterfly or moth, larva. So it's good for cabbage loopers, too. They get hmm. into your broccoli. <laughs> huh. So you could spray it right on your broccoli and cabbage yeah. plants? Yeah. And it's only toxic to Lepidoptera. Hmm. Nothing else. Yeah, there's a strain of, of BT that you can use to kill mosquitoes, too. Yeah. And I, I uh, buy that. 32 bucks from Better B. Yeah. For, uh, uh, back on that uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, there's different strains of that. And I think the one that's in the Sertan or whatever it is, is not the same one that goes on to row crops or vegetables. Oh, is that right? Yeah, or mosquitoes. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, this is a B402 Sertan for wax moths. Wow, what, 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 what smart people on tonight. <laughs> yeah, people know how to use Google. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else have any other ideas for, for John about wax moths that how they dealt with them? So I've been thinking about taking a, 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 an old freezer, putting a little fan in the top side of it to store my frames and stuff over the, over the winter to keep, you know, cause I had mouse mice problems last year. I, I, I lost a bunch. I've actually lost hive bodies and frames, plastic and wood to the mice where they just chewed right through them wow. and uh so I'm, I'm thinking that as, as that using that as a mouse preventative and if i can get a a fan in there kind of one down and a vent down below one up high one down below to get the cross flow of ventilation uh using you know a little five bolt Bam, that might be something that's worthwhile or not. I'll find out next next year about this time. But what about mothballs? Yeah, that always works for me. It, for the moths, yeah, absolutely. I have yeah, no problem with the moths. But the mice really like the mothballs. They yeah, ate them. That's funny. <laughs> well, I, I put mine in a uh, plastic uh, uh, tin or, or not, a, like a clothing storage box. Yeah. It's all plastic and it seals out the top. And uh, I put all my frames in there and throw in a handful of mothballs. Just make sure it's paradichlorobenzene. Yeah. That's the right kind to put in. They went right through the bin. They oh, wow. right through the, the plastic bin. bin. Wait, so you need steel bins. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that's why right. it's like, I'm going to make a steel, some steel bins. Then I looked at shelving units and then I, yeah. somebody, somebody was giving away a free, uh, an old, freezer it's oh, like yeah. perfect yeah. <laughs> well, Done. you don't even have to run it yeah exactly it's not plugged in it's not even working <laughs> got it and go it'll hold like uh i think it'll hold four deep three or four three deeps maybe three deeps and a medium you call that a frame safe frame safe that's what it is yeah. but you can't just pop them in there without some kind of ventilation because they'll mold. Right. Uh, Although the bees will clean that right up still, uh, I'd much rather not give them moldy stuff and then potentially get moldy honey. That would suck. So any other questions? I've got a question. So I know bearding is normal when bees are, when it's hot, but I have one hive that is doing a lot more bearding than the other hives. Um, yeah, it's the same thing. Is that indicative of needing to split? I was just in the other day and actually my, I was in to um, harvest honey, but there were no swarm cells, so it, it didn't look like they were preparing to do anything. They're just always on the porch, and I just wondered. Population of that one a lot bigger than the others? That would do yeah, it. Yeah, and it came from a it, it came from a swarm from a friend of mine who lives up in Berks County. He didn't want the swarm, and it was a huge, 
huge swarm and they've yeah. the, the queen is laying like crazy um i guess i could split them they're the yeah i mean the only they may not medium, be ready to yeah they're the only medium hive i've got right you running now. solid or screen bottom marcy um i think that one is screen yeah that one's screen but i I've, I've got the the signage you know the the uh what's it called the chloroplast stuff i've got that in maybe if i pull that out that would yeah, help take too. take that out yeah give I them usually, some more ventilation i usually keep that in less. just to be able to monitor mite drop when i treat yeah. but yeah yeah which sure was hot the past couple of days for early june lord yes it was yes. tomorrow will be different Thank goodness. That's when I plan to extract then, um, the honey that I pulled. Different. <laughs> yeah. You know, you could set your boxes back. I don't know if all your, if, if you know, if, if you've set your supers back a little bit or all your supers are aligned, you know, if he's just trying to increase the ventilation, take the whiteboard out of the bottom board, set your supers back a little bit, prop your top out up a little bit. I mean, I don't think it, I don't think it hurts the bees to be outside the hive per se, you know, but you know, they're probably telling you for some reason it's too hot now. Are, are there genetic differences and 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 how certain bees tolerate heat? I, I've often wondered that because you know I have the same thing. I, I think I have some bees that prefer to be out than in, but I'm not sure if it's that or if it's just the environmental conditions. I could get some more air ventilation through that hive. Do you set your boxes supers back or no? I I always have them lined up. It's like my own little weird thing that Bang. I like when they're lined up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it bothers it bothers me when they're when they're askew you know people you know, every time back, i say to do that down. they say you know what about the rain and and the bees a, a the bees just line up with their heads to to keep the rain out and if yeah. you have a telescope and cover it overhangs it a bit and if it rains yeah. in, it's just going to run down the sides right. but i i think i it sounds like your population's big and and they're there's was, not enough yeah, air it was movement. Big, big when I brought them home. I couldn't believe the size of the swarm. Not enough air movement. I'm not sure if that's a if that's a right assumption or not. But it, if you wanted them more in your hive, you'd probably get some air movement through there. Okay. And it may help dry out your honey too, right? If you're looking to, you know, if you're looking. Yeah, to, they. I was able to pull an, a medium off of there the other day. That was everything was capped, and uh, I mean the. Every, the queen's laying really well in that hive and I had two hives that I checked that they must have swarmed and I know the one had um, queen cells in it because I had split that one and because they had super procedure cells and they and I so I quick split it hoping that I could you know avoid mm -hmm. having that having them swarm but they swarmed anyway and that's the one that Ed came over and got out of the tree for me <laughs> um but then the nuke that I had just bought from Ernie this spring, that one also swarmed, which pissed me off because I paid extra for the marked queen and she's gone, you know, and, and so are a lot of the bees. But that hive, they were there were cells in there, too. And there were still when I when I was in there two days ago um, or no, it was yesterday. There were no, there was no brood. So yeah, I pulled I pulled frames from other hives and put a frame of eggs in two of the hives. And I was just like, you know, what the heck they had, they had cells built. <laughs> I don't understand what happened. And I mean, it, the timeline because of all the rain and finishing school and um, she should have emerged already and, and been mated and laying, but so put some frames of frames of eggs in there and some capped brood so that they'll be able to increase their population as well. Yeah. But so my honey harvest hasn't been as high as what I had hoped for because no one like I had a couple swarms and then then things that I wasn't aware of that happened. So, you know, they weren't pulling they, they were pulling nectar in, but they weren't building comb to fill super. Yeah. So. Which I didn't realize. Ed told me that he said, yeah, if you don't have a queen, they won't build comb, which I think is interesting. Hmm. It'll fill up frames of nectar quickly. Yeah, though. exactly. Yeah, for sure. Eighty percent of the time, the hive's going to requeen itself. So I always tell people, be patient. You know, more than likely, I have a, I have one like that right now. That, but I can't be patient. I'm always checking. For, even though I tell people to wait three to four weeks and put the date <laughs> on it, and you're not going to do anything different. I'm in there every three days looking for the queen, and you know <laughs> she ain't there. <laughs> but but they've someone said like. Sometimes you'll go into a hive and all the frames will be packed of nectar. 
like all of them, and, and there won't be any room left. And this hive, like there's clearly two or three frames where they have polished cells, where there is, they clearly have a, a, a brood, you know, a brood area that, and, and I've heard that maybe that's a good sign that, that they know that there's a virgin or there's a queen to be coming, like they haven't filled it all in with nectar. I'm not sure if that's true or not though, but something else to look for, you know? <laughs> you have drone comb in your hive? Uh, yeah, I had I had some, not an excessive amount. Put in a green drone comb, you know the special ones for. Yeah, I have some of those. I just I haven't put them in because I'm always I, uh, I just finished school on Friday, so <laughs> now I can actually focus on other stuff and remember to pull the frame at the right time so I don't <laughs> make a drone bomb. Well, I've noticed that uh, when the queen leaves, they uh, forget about that green drone comb and they Ooh. turn it into honey. Hmm. Oh, and then that's a nice honey frame. Honey and nectar. I pulled a, a medium frame that they had built wonky comb, and it's like twice as wide and full of honey as what it should be. And the one next to it was, you know, just real shallow, but they hadn't built that one out right. So I'm, wow. I'm looking forward to being able to extract that one because it's like double the thickness. I think it's probably comparable to a deep frame, but I have six deeps and I think, 11 or 12 um, mediums to, to extract. So I'm hoping to do that tomorrow when it's raining because then I'll have an excuse to not be out planting peppers or tomatoes. <laughs> and everyone's, you know, the bees forage a mile, Marcy, so it may not be all your beekeeping. Who knows? Maybe for some whatever reason, whatever's in your area didn't produce as much this year, you know, yeah. so... You know, well, Ed's I, only two miles away, and he had like two and a half gallons uh, way, a couple weeks ago, so yeah. <laughs> who knows. But he also has like a bazillion hives now because he's gotten so many swarms. I, I don't know how many he's up to. He yeah, had, I was over his place with Jeff, and I was like, what's going on back here? It's turned into like a hive jungle, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've, I've pulled about 160 pounds so far. Nice. Uh, really just three hives. Um, I've got six right now. One's a nuke and then um, two are rebuilding from queen losses. Uh, so not a lot of honey off of those. those yeah. But the other three are, I, I did 54 pounds just off of the flow hive, off of two flow hives. Nice. And how long did that take, Mark, to extract from the flow hive? Uh, took from the time I walked out the back door till the time I walked in with six, eight, nine half gallon jars of honey. I walked back in at eight o'clock, so three hours. Three hours, okay. And and most of that time was sitting there on Facebook and checking email on my phone, watching the flow, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> glancing at the flow making sure that no bottles overflow. Yeah. So, yeah. So you literally just have to put a jar underneath it and open the tap? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And Sounds a lot less sticky. A lot less than sticky. I'm capping. <laughs> and I'm capping. You're sitting there grinding, you know, spinning and spinning and spinning. And that's good exercise, but on a good hot day, that that's kind of miserable. And Monday was... This is the day I did it, and that was a miserably hot. It sure season. was. Um, I mean, you still have to check. You just can't say, oh, I'm going to just extract. Yeah, you you got to pull a couple of frames to make sure they are capped, or you'll end up with extracting nectar. Yeah. Oof. Do you Those lose of you your with comb on that? Sorry. Go ahead. Do you lose your comb on that? Is it a crush and strain system or with the flow it, hive? With the flow hive, it's plastic. Uh, the, the cells are plastic like this, and then there's like a small gap all the way around. The bees come in and put a very fine line of wax around the inside of the cell. And when you turn the key, the cell does this. Oh, so okay. one side moves about halfway down, and then the honey goes to the back of the cell down the tube, down the, the inside of the frame and comes out the tube into your jar. 
Uh, it's not for, if you're going to do a lot of, a lot of hives, you're going to do traditional method. It's not cost effective, but if you're doing two or three hives, it makes good sense. Okay, cool. Quick question about comb. I find that when I extract like the, the comb that they built is real delicate. And I mean, how I use my uncapping fork to lift it and try to be as gentle as possible, but I feel like there's not much left um, for them to do anything with it. <laughs> I mean, what does everybody else do? I know Ed just does pressure and strain because he doesn't think it's worth it to save it. Oh. I have Marcy, are you using the uncapping forth like a shovel digging in or just scratching no, just, the surface? I'm using it to pry up the, the wax on the top. But, but you're putting the points in and then lifting up. Right. Right. Rather than taking, if you just take the, the points on the tines and scr literally scratch it, you may not damage as much of the sidewalls. And so you, you may be left with more comb. You know, Justin also has the uh, Harmony Hill uncapper, the club's uncapper that Justin has. And it's basically metal rollers that you just basically push the frame in and pull it up. And it really works well. I've actually uh, got one for myself now. And, uh, you know, it takes a little arm power to push it down and up, but it's, it, you don't have, it, you, you have very little wax at the end and, and it just slices the vertical slices, the comb and nice. you spin the frames and it's, a, it's amazing all, all the honey's out of it. So there it's an expensive piece of, you know, <laughs> metal basically, but it works really well. Marcy, it also could be using a, a manual extractor or a powered extractor. Manual. Okay. But, um, I know with a powered one, if you spin it too fast, too long, that'll the comb will break down. Yeah, I would imagine. So, yeah. That's the tool that I'm using now. It's yep. when I'm when I'm not doing flow hives, I'm using regular frames. This thing is. I, I had the scratching fork that was awful. I tried the one that Justin. Had. I, it was okay, but didn't like it. I've got a heated knife, powered heated knife. Thanks, Jack. Um, <laughs> I'm a giant frame, um, but this seems to work. I, I think it was twenty five or thirty dollars. Yeah, that's does about that kind of work are. like a like a cheese slicer. Yeah, like I guess cuts. it does. You, yep. you basically you basically slide it across the frame. You need to be careful because they are freaking sharp. <laughs> yes, um, they are. <laughs> I, I drove, drove one of these tines of probably <laughs> a half an inch through my finger. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> yeah, they're really sharp. Which, I thought I barely pricked my finger and there was lots of blood. So, yeah. <laughs> you no, know, I have my node. Mine didn't go that deep, but it pierced quickly. I That's, use a, a, a planer. And uh, all of my honey supers are mediums, and the planer is exactly uh, the width of the medium. So I just zip it down. It's heat, okay? Zip it down one side, flip it over, and I use these buckets. Oh, they look like wash tubs or something like that. That has, and then I, I save my cappings, and uh, either sell them or reuse them for uh, uh, waxing. Plastic, uh, plastic foundation. I've made candles on occasion, but that's not a real good idea. But anyway, yeah, this, this plane. I'm sorry. And who makes the planer, and where did you get it? it uh, you know what? I I bought it to use from a guy who wanted to get out of bit beekeeping. But I've seen them in the in the beekeeping uh, catalogs. They're they're a little on the pricey side compared to like a knife or some of the other widgets, if you will. I think they're 100, 150 bucks or something like that, but it really works well. Hmm. But you don't want to do your hand, like <laughs> Mark said, because it burns. I like I've been the, using I like electric the knife I've been using since I was a teenager. <laughs> well, I used electric knife for a while, and this planer just makes the electric knife look like peanuts to me. <laughs> I like a spiked roller. I get very little wax uh, residue with a spiked roller. 
and I think it punctures the cells just fine, and the honey blows right out. And uh, well, you can... is that is that a handheld one, Paul? Yeah, just looks like a paint roller. And then what do you do to keep it from clogging up? I've tried that in the past, and it clogged up on me. Really? Cleaning them's the biggest problem. It never never clogs. Uh, if it clogs, uh, if it gets full of wax, like at the end of the session, yeah, put it in a bucket of cold water. And just slosh it around in there, and the cold water takes the wax right off the spikes. Really? Yeah. I I used it, and I loved it the way it pierced the cells. But keeping it clean and cleaning it afterwards wasn't worth the money. I I spend more time trying to get it clean than I. It was, you know, not worth keeping it for the next time. Try right, try cold water. I found that cleans wax up a lot better than hot because it it just makes it little chunky. And uh, it seems to come off of the tines really better than uh, mm. the water. Yeah. I'll have to try that. If if you okay, put the, uh, the, the spiked roller out, the bees will clean it out very effectively. Yeah, I suppose they will. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point, Charles. They will. I didn't try that. 